uh, in Mexico, I understand, <laughs> and uh, uh, perhaps other exotic uh, countries. So uh, maybe, Professor Gintutas, you would like uh, to start our conversation and ask uh, Josip. <laughs> Yeah, Josip uh, is as well anthropologist. He uh, defended his uh, PhD and published his uh, articles, and now he's prepared new book uh, in anthropology. As well, it's very interesting that you involved in uh, uh, to uh, Latin America studies and uh, postcolonial. And uh, my uh, first question: uh, How do you consider as an artist? and the uh, anthropologist uh, contemporary postcolonial studies what uh, is me what does it mean for you why it's important for you okay th thank you very much i mean th this is a, a good question uh, as i already point out i'm both so i'm as a visual artist i'm kind of practitioner also as a professor the, so i think uh, uh, the most important thing <laughs> Let me say this in very Marxist sense. Since more important is the practice than a theory. So basically, uh, in my practice, what I do, I organize different type of workshop in Croatia and Mexico, working on these post-colonial issues. So not keeping all the uh, the thing in the theory. Normally, from the theoretical approach, I mean everything starts much much earlier with Edward Said and other other people and then Gayatri Spivak and all other scholars. Uh, and it's growing and especially it's growing with the Black Lives Matter. I mean, this sense about the post-colonial, uh, not only perspective, but also the problem in America generally. I mean, the Black Lives Matter open a lot of problem and also uh, problem of public monuments and uh, um, problem in art and, and the other thing. So, but let me go back. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, what I do, I try all the time through the different art projects, which include exhibition, uh, some conference, workshops, and a field work uh, to uh, uh, rethink this issue uh, uh, on post-colonial power and on different uh, topic of uh, trauma in Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, may, may I ask you, uh, how, how do you see uh, technological development, uh, very fast technological development, artificial intelligence, uh, participation in our everyday life in connection with the future uh, of art uh, installations? Uh, is it, the, is it the, the future of art or can we still hope for, uh, so to speak, traditional picture uh, no installation, but uh, something uh, that ma material uh, that used to be that we can touch. Uh, what is your vision of the of the future of art in in combination uh, with the very fast technological development? Okay, thank you, Thomas. From this question, now we uh, switch uh, uh, to some uh, completely other issue. Uh, but uh, um, I mean, maybe before switching to artificial intelligence, I can say something about the artwork which are, we're dealing with, with virtual reality. Because in contemporary art, some of the artists start to work with virtual reality, and basically uh, the result was not good. It was kitsch, not a good quality camp. Some of the artists like. Uh, uh, Bruce Nauman and some other produce some very interesting result. So basically what I see uh, with the media of uh, virtual real reality, I will call it a media because it's also a system of information, a system of communication, because each artwork communicate with its media. So now uh, virtual uh, reality and the artificial intelligence in the sense of art, it's also media. So when the new media start, uh, we need some time to establish a media language. So what I see, like, for example, I, I will give you a, a comparison. Uh, uh, when the movie was created, basically uh, the media of movie was very similar to painting because there was no, uh, generally there was no idea 
about the new media. So they just borrow from the painting into the movie. And then Eisenstein and uh, uh, in in America, Griffith, they design something which we call a movie media language, like editing, you know, and some other thing. So I think in virtual reality and the artificial intelligence, this new language, media language have to be developed. It's not still developed. What I see now, uh, uh, how artists use uh, basically artificial intelligence, I mean, it's not good result. It's very decorative or it's uh, still not, uh, um, let's say, um, Mm, very decorative or it's still not very clean if they use it in post-conceptual art. They are more playing with it. Like uh, one of the students I teach, she used artificial intelligence in researching uh, one uh, um, uh, part of Zagreb, which was used during a socialism, which was a pioneer, they call it a pioneer city. Pioneer was like a uh, socialist youth. So it was a huge complex which had this like a socialist uh, heritage. After it, it was abandoned. Now there is some even some refugees, some youth are coming there, but it's have this socialist past. So basically she wanted to deal with uh, the history of the place and she just put some information of this place into the artificial intelligence and the uh, result was a kind, a kind of joke, you know. So it's not... Uh, how to say, I see this uh, uh, still as a trap because the media language is not developed. It will be developed in the future. Uh, maybe other question is about the question about the copyright, who is author, who is not. You are a professor at university like me. And sometimes people ask me, how you gonna, how you will recognize if some of your students use, uh, uh, use to write uh, their seminar artificial intelligence? I say, or I always say, I will know it for sure. Because like like before, if somebody copy paste the seminar or steal or somebody else wrote you because you know the student, you know him by person and you know his uh, or her capacity uh, for writing. So very similar. I mean, very similar with artificial intelligence. By, by the way, uh, I think in 2021, there was a scandal um, uh, in the United States. There was a competition for uh, for the best drawing uh, under particular criteria, maybe you know that that case, that uh, it turned out that the, the winner of the uh, uh, contest uh, was artificial intelligence that uh, ma made the best painting uh, wh when it was prohibited by the rules. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it turned out that the winner deceived the committee. And then after winning it, he acknowledged that it wasn't him who made the painting, uh, in order to prove that now uh, artificial intelligence can uh, paint just as well as a human being. Well, how, do you see that uh, as a, as a ethical and also copyright uh, issue? No, no, for sure it's a copyright because, you know, uh, to create a certain painting tool, you use some knowledge. And still, uh, and this knowledge was produced by somebody, or you use some style, let's say, because in artificial intelligence, you can use the option, like, you know, doing something with like a impressionist style or whatever. Yeah. But basically, I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the thing that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, somebody produced it. So it's a question of copyright. You know, it's a question of copyright. And uh, um, in the future, this have to be solved. Uh, also, uh, so this is one part of the problem. Another part of the problem is result. So I think still artists and the scholars use it more like to do the experiment. You know, now, now it's a, like a wizard, you know, thing. People are coming to artificial intelligence. Ah, look what it it's uh, the it can do or what it can create so we are still like uh, 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 we have this element of surprise we have this element of wondering it's still like a miracle like when the first when brother Lumiere uh, uh, was showing the first movie you know people was also wondering and really in shock so it's a still same thing with the artificial intelligence but I said it's a process which have to be continued another question uh, for you you know that uh, 
Putin uh, ordinary presents himself as a big defender of post-colonial world, you know, in the last his speeches. Yeah, and, yeah. He inter- and he interprets that he that Russia fights for uh, post-colonial uh, people, you know, in Latin America and Africa, and try to use this uh, for pro- for his own propaganda purposes. From the other side, uh, Russian small small Russian nations as Le- as Bashkirs, Tatars, you know, uh, Kalmyks and others, uh, they would like to develop their own post-colonial vision, art, and uh, studies, and do post-colonial projects. However, uh, Russia negates this one uh, post-colonialism. So from the one side, they provide this uh, anti-Western post-colonial discourse, uh, and especially in the case of Mexico, Colombia, uh, Guatemala, and other Latin America countries, from the other side, they completely uh, uh, Rus- uh, Russian fascists completely negates uh, their own nations and their uh, cultural autonomy. So uh, we see how it's it's very new that uh, postcolonial discourse could be included into fascist uh, discourse, which never happened before. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, how do you think uh, in this one sense for leftist movement, you know, and so this misuse, misuse of postcolonial discourse or misusing of postcolonial art? Okay, this is a very good statement. I completely agree with you because there is no difference between imperialism. So Russian imperialism and colonialism just had another form. Like, for example, me coming from uh, uh, Balkan, also there was a different type of colonialism. We had first, we have Austro-Hungarian colonialism, then we had the Venice colonialism, we've been colonized by Ottoman, then we, uh, last phase, we've been colonized by the Serbs. So, I mean, you have a different different type of colonialism, colonialism and uh, methods are different. You know, once I asked one student of mine in Mexico, what was the difference between uh, colonization in United in today United States and colonization in in Mexico, like in Spanish part and uh, uh, Portugal part and uh, English part? Yeah. So he uh, explained me that the methods are different, and that English was colonizing by killing, by genocide. Uh, Portuguese they've been colonizing by robbing, stealing, and Spanish, they've been colonizing by sex, raping. And that's the reason why in the country where it's a Spanish language, you have so much, so many mixed people, because they use a sex and raping as a form of colonization. So this is a very interesting answer because it's explaining you that colonization can be different. And now uh, this what uh, Russian official uh, politics is doing, that they're using uh, idea post-colonial discourse for their own fascism, it's really unique. And why this can happen? Uh, it can happen why, uh, because basically in Latin America, they really suffer now on American colonialism which is normally, it's economical, it's different, it's not by raping, it's not by killing, it's by the economical uh, domination. And other type of domination, normally it's uh, uh, produced with uh, uh, multinational companies, basically from United States, and the other other type of domination. And then, for example, in Mexico, uh, you have a political elite, and basically this political elite, they send their children to study in the United States, like the best faculty, best university, and they are coming back and they rule the country, even they don't trust to their own own university. This is the interesting thing. So the colonization are going also through education. And normally because of this in Latin America, they as because they always see United States as a kind of enemy, they see uh, Russia, which is like the biggest enemy of uh, United States, as a friend, which is completely ridiculous and normally they recognize one imperialism don't recognize the another and i had a big problem for example once i spoke with one colleague in uh, mexico city and he was denying gulag even some mexican leftists they think that gulag 
uh, that it doesn't exist, that it's a Western America propaganda, you know. So their stupid belief uh, in uh, Russia as a kind of uh, 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 country which inherit the socialist and communist tradition and the leftist idea, it's, uh, it's stupid. I mean, last summer when I was in Lima in Peru, also you, you see the uh, uh, the headquarter of the Communist Party of uh, Peru, and you see the poster with Putin, and it's written uh, uh, down, it's written Putin, the real communist, you know, so this is what they think. And even even the, the, the Pope uh, Francis, who is from Argentina, even he uh, now uh, keeps going to Hungary to visit Orban, he keeps seeking uh, peace, um, I see. I see. Even from the side of the Pope, there is a really a lack of understanding. No, he. I think. Uh, yeah, Pope Francis. He, as a typical South American representative, he don't understand European history, and he is not conscious uh, on uh, uh, Russian imperialism or different form of uh, form of imperialism. It's very, very visible. I think he is completely uh, stuck in the situation, and we have now. Uh, 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 I mean, for example, when John Paul II was the Pope, we had like an opposite, but very far opposite. And then he was afraid of everything which was basically linked. This was another another extreme, everything which was coming from the East. But now we have somebody who completely don't don't understand. And, you know, it's what is bizarre, what I see as a bizarre at this moment, because uh, uh, he's doing this, Pope is doing this with uh, this you know, very nice idea of ecumenism, but you know how to produce ecumenism with the fascist. You know, sorry. Yeah, uh, you're right, and especially concerning uh, Putin, who is the biggest oligarch and billionaire, you know, and exploitator, and you know, in the Russia, and one of the biggest in the world. He is interpreted as a communist, you know, and the communist idea. This is. Strange, I see here the crisis of leftist movement, and uh, this crisis of leftist movements uh, explains us uh, why do they use this uh, postcolonialism as misconception, some, you know, for uh, for propaganda and imperial purposes. But um, as uh, Josip, you are a visitor of as as well of. Uh, uh, Zapatistas in uh, Chiapas uh, region, you know, you met with them, and uh, could you a little bit tell us about their own condition? What do they think now about the world? What do they fight? What's the art of them? What's uh, from your anthropological viewpoint? Okay, okay. Uh, I need what I personally can tell you. I mean, uh, I no, personally, one of the leader of the Zapatists, and I basically who create uh, the idea. And his wife, they're both anthropologists. I will not mention their name. Uh, 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 I mean, with them, I don't discuss about this war because I see no sense, you know, uh, no sense. Uh, but what I respect in uh, Zapatist movement in uh, in Mexico is that it's really autonomous territory and it's really organized by uh, direct democracy. And uh, what is maybe the most interesting, it's only part in Mexico where you don't have cartels, you know. So this is, people don't understand also that this horrible cartel industry is organized because there is a market for the drugs and the market for the drugs is basically United States. So again, it's connected. This is the reason why their leftists uh, basically see always America as the enemy. Understand? So this is uh, like a very black and white image, you know? Yeah. Like, but, uh, do, you, do, do you consider them as a party as some kind of autonomist because they fight against big corporations, you know, cartels and so on? It, okay. it is not similar to a traditional communist who... Ordinary supports big, big industries, cartels, corporations, you know, and the capital. This is why uh, sometimes probably uh, people mixed uh, Putin with communists because he is big supporter of state capitalism, you know, as is his own capitalism. I mean, it's this is what Antonio Negri once said. I mean, Antonio Negri said that uh, 
uh, I mean, basically in Yugoslavia also, we had this self-management uh, socialism, but he said that it was a state capitalism. I mean, it's all state capitalism, because if you have a surplus, you all the time in the capitalism. But I mean, maybe a little bit about this uh, Zapatist organization. Uh, I mean, it's have this also ethnical background, because these people who run uh, this party uh, of Mexico, they are uh, basically they are Mayan. They speak Mayan language, so it's a different language. It's not Spanish. And so, in a way, it's also connected, you know, with the co with the real colonization, because Mayan people, contrary to Aztecs, they've been more clever. Why? Because they, uh, uh, the colleague of mine, Mexico, told me this story. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, were very successful. They uh, took as a prisoner one Jesuit priest, and they could learn the language, and they, for example, they knew the Spanish are not gods. And this was the mistake by the Aztecs. I mean, the mistake was because they believed the cortex was God. So in a way, Mayan people, they keep their own tradition, especially in Yucatan and normal in Chiapas. And so this autonomous zone, okay, it's include also like uh, ethnical, uh, uh, ethnical uh, um, idea because it's, uh, it's uh, uh, basically Mayan autonomy. And also, I mean, the, the interesting, uh, uh, the interesting thing uh, uh, um, there, what you, um, it's about industrialization. So I think the in communism, industrialization was uh, basically uh, connected with the idea how to get rid of the conservative society. I know in socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, basically, uh, they were speaking that Yugoslavia is a country of uh, uh, of uh, workers and uh, honest intelligence. So nobody mentioned a peasant. Why? Because a uh, village in this uh, uh, Yugoslavian Marxist narration was imagined like uh, something conservative, uh, retrograde. And basically, if you move a peasant, if you move a villager to the city, if they become a worker, they're going to transform, you know, into something different. They will become a proletariat and they will have this uh, uh, proletariat consciousness. So, uh, you know, this idea of industrialization basically was in communism linked with this. And that's the reason why they created the kolkhoz. You know, they created, a, 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 like in you being part of so Soviet Union, you had a kolkhoz. In Yugoslavia, we didn't have a kolkhoz. They tried, but they saw it will be fucking impossible. So they created a co cooperative where you could be part of cooperative by your own will. But they didn't took a property. So in Yugoslavia, peasant could have a land. But they forced them because through this uh, uh, industrialization, they thought they will change. Uh, uh, they will change uh, in a way um, the position of the of the peasant. I mean, what is going on in Chapas? I'm not so big expert. I mean, because I just know the people who created it from a philosophical, ideological part of. Uh, the view, but it's not about the, yeah, it's a defense to the company, but it's more like a small commune, you know, which is organizing some production. So it's not like a part of Mexico, which is highly uh, uh, indust industrialized. I mean, uh, and basically, normally that they are fighting against the company. Corporation is, in the term of biopolitics, corporation is the one who are creating the creating this uh, system of power and this system of slavery. Uh, uh, Yosef, could you let, uh, explain about the role of art and culture in Chiapas province between the Zapatists? Do they have some kind of artist movement or just, you know, uh, organize their own their social life? Okay, I didn't work there. I told you, I didn't work there intensively. I work in Mexico in another place, uh, called San Luis Potosí, basically where you have also Zapatist idea. Okay, and uh, this I can tell you uh, uh, more about, because it will be... Uh, uh -huh. Okay, in any way, yeah. the rule of yeah. art. So this I will tell you, I mean, there is a... Uh, okay, this is a very interesting. Uh, why? Because uh, basically in San Luis Potosí, another city in Mexico, but on a case of San Luis Potosí, where I organized a workshop and I had a research, you can see a, a Zapatist monument in a public space 
which look which are completely romanticized. So you have a basically colonial image of the Zapatists. And what my student in Mexico, Mexican done, basically they criticize these people. They were creating a new image uh, of uh, of this monument, uh, playing with the new uh, 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 type of Mexican, because there is some Mexican who want to be like American, and they uh, uh, they behave like American, and basically they are uh, uh, the most close to this corporative American consciousness. Then you have like a old leftists, you have a lot of idea. But what is interesting that generally in uh, in Mexico uh, uh, dominant ideology, uh, uh, um, the Zapatist movement is completely the old one. It's romanticized, and you can see it in public space. And then you see the the public monument of the Zapatists, which look like you know the very similar to the, for example, to some 19th century continental European monument to some battle or the uh, socialist socialist monument to battle in in Second World War. What I wanted to say, and what what is interesting now, because this was the first part of my workshop, a student been researching these monuments, and they be researching also some neighborhood in San Luis Potosi, which are kind of problematic with the cartels. You know, uh, 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 first they have to present what is going on there in this neighborhood, and what is going on with this. Uh, uh, with this monument, with this imaginary of Zapatis, because this is two image which we have about basically about Latin America. There is drugs and there is revolutionary. You know, you have Che Guevara or you have Pablo Escobar. Understand? Or El Chapo. This is completely wrong. Normally, Latin America is much more. It's not only that. And always... In, in American movie, in Hollywood movie, you see when people are passing, this is a completely racist. When they're passing United States, Mexican border, from one side, you have a nice, you know, everything is organized, policemen. Other side, you have some immediately alcohol, prostitutes, you know. This is the image which was given to us, to European, basically. And this is the division. So what first I thing which I done with the student, okay, present me now these two problems. Uh, one neighborhood could really look like this image and present me this Zapatist, you know, converted now in like official ideology, but also uh, uh, with the Western discourse. And then when they present, we start to work how to uh, demolish this image, how to rethink this image, what we can do, basically using the term of social art or maybe not what is the possibility you know because uh, 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 the every day of the student uh, uh, with whom i work there in mexico everyday life is like uh, one of the of, of the student i work she created the video like in the neighborhood she live and it's not so danger like and then she's walking with the dog and then she's sh showing the cross, the flower, you know, the one woman was killed and raped there and there. So it's an everyday life. They're surrounded by this. Not only problematic neighborhood. And then, but normally all life there is different. It's not only this, but this is what we, in our colonial brain, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, imagine about Latin America, which is completely wrong, but because there is much more thing, you know, much more thing than this. That's uh, interesting, and uh, I try to apply your experience and think about the uh, Ukrainian case, you know, because Ukraine and we uh, meet uh, uh, very non, it looks like non similar, but uh, really quite similar uh, problems because uh, from the one side, uh, Ukrainians try to create their own image independent from Soviet Union and uh, Russia. Uh, in the earlier period, the same was in uh, in uh, Baltic countries when we try to escape from this, you know, imperial image uh, that we are Russians, you know, and that all our culture should be Russia. But it's not so easy to create your own uh, vision, you know, or your own uh, uh, critical artworks uh, only uh, only in collaboration. Thomas asked you about, uh, you know, Thomas asked you about uh, uh, Francisque Hurst uh, 
Pope, but uh, I remember, you know, that uh, uh, as well about uh, uh, situation, uh, you know, uh, in Russia that uh, we, we see this conflict between uh, Orthodox churches, you know, and Orthodox churches split uh, in between uh, Russia and Ukraine, but in any way, uh, churches uh, do very big influence on post-colonial or imperial feeling, you know. And this is as well as uh, probably exists in Latin America. The, the, what ca can you say about the role of Catholic Church or other churches and their influence on this, uh, you know, I would say uh, colonial and post-colonial conditions. Do church help uh, to uh, escape from this, uh, you know, imperial or uh, colonial condition or just uh, cons conservate you know uh, or keep you in this one uh, condition because church is very conservative and don't allow this uh, modernization what's your opinion about role of uh, church probably catholic church in uh, mexico in this con concerning uh, colonial post-colonial condition Okay, this is a very uh, hard topic here. Basically, in Mexico, we can speak about uh, Catholic Church because it's, it's, it's dominant. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, the condition how Catholic Church worked there from Juarez time is completely different because Mexico, uh, in a way, is organized like extreme secular state. So, I mean, uh, the church property was taken before. So, basically... Uh, their pro property is limited, uh, and they work, uh, they are focused more to work with the people. So basically, it, they are linked to something which they called before uh, theology of liberation, you know, for this movement. And, uh, but what I see, I mean, uh, they cannot operate like in Europe. I mean, first, uh, 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 I mean, Catholicism is a kind of eclectic religion. Everywhere they come, you know, during colonization, they were taking from a different culture. They are chopping from different culture and uh, incorporating it uh, into their uh, tradition and uh, the rituals. So it's very obvious in Mexico. So the friend of mine, uh, Miguel Vasallo, and he showed me uh, one of the first uh, um, uh, church uh, uh, in in Mexico, how it looked like. I mean, it basically it's open space, and you have the altar on the open space and one cross. And they ask him. I said, this is not. There is no building. It's just open space. And then he explained, yes, this is how they start. Why? Because the Aztecs and Maya they had a ritual on the top of the pyramid on plateau. So it was always the ritual was on the open space. And then normally native people who been colonized and baptized, now become a Christian or Catholics, they have to accept it. And they couldn't accept it that ritual is in some closed space. Understand? The closed space was created after. So, I mean, basically, this is eclectic idea. So now also, they operate, they are much normally uh, more close to the poor. And they have, they are working uh, more like a social work and different i mean what what i was impressed in uh, uh in mexico what i was impressed all the time i mean basically when you come to the church it's like a very beautiful ritual uh, once for the christmas i was there uh five times in different service because they have a singing full of it's very interesting i mean basically it's like artwork so for us for european you can come there and look at like artwork because the singing is so beautiful, and then you see it's uh, okay, full of people. They they work in uh, different traditions. So normally they keep the colonization, but let's say more clever, you know, including the the elements uh, the elements uh, uh, in the um, in the ritual in the new let's say let's say new uh, quality. This dirty side, I don't know. You know what is going on. Uh, they are in Latin America. They are focused on universities, so the very good university are private university are run by the church. I saw it in Bogota, in Colombia. I think in Peru also. In Mexico, no. As I said Mexico is more secular state, so the things things are different. Yeah.
And about uh, this, uh, uh, you know, shamanistic or native movements, uh, as well interesting how they uh, are important because tourists and uh, different uh, uh, occultism lovers, you know, they imagine uh, Mexico as the Don Juan uh, place, you know, where all everything happened with uh, peyotli dreams, coyotes, you know. And so on that this is so imagined uh, a holy or magical place, uh, you know, and uh, not only Mexico, but as well many of uh, Latin America countries, Amazon uh, jungles are imagined as magical places. You know, it's not only about Che Guevara and, uh, El, El, you know, these mafia gangs, but as well about... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, about uh, Peyotli and traveling to cosmos. How it's, uh, and actually it's very popular between tourists, pro probably, uh, tourist yeah. industries. And uh, could you explain the role of this, all this new age and shamanism in your studies, as well in the, these regions of Mexico where you've been? Okay. Okay. Let me first explain. I mean, uh, I done my PhD research in India. My research is still still continuing. I was researching the space in Tibetan Buddhist painting, and basically, this uh, conceptualization of the space in Tibetan Buddhist painting is produced with a state of trance. So they you they use a kind of trance through meditation uh, to paint and to produce again with the painting a kind of state of trance. So at this state of trance, you can normally compare it to psychedelic experience. Okay, it is a psychedelic experience, but without the psychedelic substance. Like a shaman, shaman work with the drums, or he work with the substance. So it's different, uh, different type of trance. So let me go back to your question. Basically, I mean it again in this Western uh, 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 post-colonial uh, gaze. Uh, uh, Mexico is linked normally to Carlos Castaneda and Bra Amazona region to Ahuasca. Yeah. And Mexico, I mean, generally uh, with Carlos Castaneda, everything is linked to this cactus, peyote. Uh, so I done an exhibition in 2021 and I done a three time I done research in the desert of Vercuta. So the end of the desert of Vercuta is. Uh, uh, city of Real de Catorce. And basically this city is very interesting for this all new age uh, pilgrimage, but also a lot of famous people are coming there like to have this cosmic experience. I call this, I mean, all this uh, new age uh, um, uh, a protocol, a new age experience, I call it like an instant uh, enlightenment because they're all coming for kind of enlightenment uh, but instant, fast nirvana, okay? So to Real de Catorce, uh, uh, Julia Roberts came, you know, then John Depp, many famous people, and then you have, I will not again mention the name, a uh, person who is responsible to bring them to the desert and to have peyote experience. And this person is the one who is working with the star. Normally, this is, again, uh, illegal in Mexico because the peyote ritual is uh, only for Huachol Indians or Yak Indians, which are on the north, which basically Sonora Desert. This is another desert and the holy place of uh, Huachol Indians, uh, where they uh, where they believe that this is center of the world, like Oftamos, like Delphi for them. Yeah, so they believe the center of the world that is there. Cosmos was created. And basically, they don't live in the desert. They live in another part of Mexico, like around 500 kilometers far away. And they are coming there to do the peyote pilgrimage. They cut a lot of peyote. And then in the trance, they communicate uh, uh, with their God. Even they believe that the peyote is a God. So for them, peyote is not only, this is very interesting. It's not only psychedelic substance which bring them to alter state of the consciousness, like a shaman in shamanistic tradition, use this drum or this, and then he climbed to the letter, you know, letter up uh, uh, to other world. For them, it's not only the letter to other world, it's also a god, okay? This is a very, very complex. Then they have deer as a god, they have different symbols. 
but peyote is a god. And what is interesting, you know, this is this is completely mixed with Catholic tradition. So in Real de Catorce, you have a church, a Franciscan church of San Antonio, a huge church. So you have a Catholic pilgrimage and also peyote pilgrimage, Huachol and the other. Mm-hmm. And then on the main square, I was there for the Christmas, 2021. You have a Christmas tree. And on the Christmas tree, you have the ornaments, but it's not ball. It's a small peyote. You know, they do the small peyote for the Christmas tree. So this is the top crazy combination with which where I see that, you know, Catholic tradition also, you know, allow, you know, this peyote pilgrimage and ornament of the official Christmas tree of the church, you know, on the main square. So it's, you know, some things are really different, you know. But let me let me go back to uh, Real de Catorce. Yeah, so uh, this is interesting that uh, the city was uh, basically also product of colonization because Spanish constructed uh, there uh, to use it uh, as a mine because there, they, they, there was a silver mine then. And then this, when the silver was done, it was abandoned completely. Nobody lived there. And then in the 60s, 70s with the hippies, and then normally after Carlos Castaneda, start to be again, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, very populated. So you have a lot of hotel there, a lot of people are coming there, but it's illegal. So it's when you go to the desert, it's written, it's pro- prohibited by law. I don't know what is the punishment. Even you can go 10 years to prison, they say, you know. But in Mexico, the police is same as cartel, you know. They, you have in, in some city, like in San Luis Potosí, even you have a cartel organized by police. So police have its own cartel. So, I mean, something can, it's very uh, flexible law, understand. So that's the reason why people who bring this new age uh, uh, people to the desert, they can do it. You know, even these people are not Indian, they are going there and they are showing them at the place. So you have a lot of, a lot of layer uh, uh, in in this tradition. But for me, what was interesting, I was uh, uh, walking in the desert with, uh, uh, with the person uh, who know it. He was showing me the holy place of the Indian and the shrine. After eating a, a peyote, the, basically the medicine man uh, of Huachol, I mean, uh, he is working with the, uh, uh, with the offering of the people. So on the shrine, you have the offering. And basically, then you see the wishes for what people are afraid, for what offering is for. And then you see like a small made by wax or some other material, small truck. Somebody want a truck or want the car, you know. Also, this religion, you know, for us looks so spiritual, like peyote, you know. But basically, people want a new car. So again, it's, you know, it's a kind of uh, a new age mix all, also in this, like, you know, like in... Uh, in Amazona, Peru, or Brazil, with ayahuasca, you know, the people come there and pay a very expensive treatment. In Peru, for example, it's completely legal. They call it ayahuasca treatment. So people pay it like Marina Abramovic. They go and they do this ritual as a part of experience, and they think that they reach some state of consciousness, which is uh, completely instant. Yeah. So my. Uh... Uh, I know that our guest has uh, to end uh, because uh, we agreed on 45 minutes, but it's so interesting, so exotic, so uh, your stories are so lively that uh, my suggestion is to call it the first part of uh, our podcast with you and uh, in the near future to plan a second part. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Uh, Yeah, listen, there is a lot of story. We can extend a little bit more. I mean, because it's, uh, so many elements. Normally, there is a danger. I mean, I went to some place which are, you know, quite complicated to go. And I could go because of the friend of mine, Manolo Cocho from Mexico City, who have a cows in Portrero near Real de Cartors. He know the Indians. He know the pilgrimage. You know, he could show me the place. Or Miguel Vasallo, anthropologist from Mexico City, who basically was a uh, right hand of Comandante Marcos in Chapas, you know, and then when you have the entrance, but well, this is the normal in anthropology, you need. 